I'd like to welcome you all um, to our OpenStack architecture for the enterprise. Um, we've got a quite a lot to get through today, so we're going to go through it as quickly as we can. Not, um, so, my, I'm Keith Tobin. I'm, I'm part of uh, Dell Cloud Services. Um, I'm based in, in Ireland in the uh, Dublin Center of Excellence, and this is Greg Jacobs. Also in the Dell Center of Excellence, uh, located in the United States. Okay, so. Do you want to kick, you want to kick off? Pardon me? Do you want to go on the. So, part of our, our, our. where we're coming from, I suppose, is in, in, this, um, in this talk is to, is to look at OpenStack in the, in, in the, uh, in the context of, of enterprise, as opposed to the context of, of, of provider scale. Okay? So, we had a number of design goals when we set about doing this, and uh, part of our design goals was to was to really focus on the on the requirements that enterprises have, as opposed to the requirements that a provider has. And in some parts they're the same, and in some parts they're different. So we set we set about having a number of design goals, um, and, and you know in this architecture, um, and the design goals like we, we looked at you know was you know, zero downtime um, you know, across the control layer. So you know, the most important part for us, or one of the, one of, one of the important parts was, was to have that zero downtime. No data loss, okay? So again, the idea being that it, you know, in this model that uh, if there's a failure that we actually have, you know, no data loss within the control layer. Um, durability, um, the model that, uh, you know, that, that's fairly well accepted within the Within the provider model is 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 to provide for forward-leaning applications. Okay, but in enterprises, not all applications are going to be forward-leaning. We're going to have some applications that are backward-leaning, some legacy applications that are basically enterprise-grade applications, and these applications have 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 their resilience expected within the actual stack itself, and not within the software. And we need to be able to provide for this in the enterprise context. So the other part as well is, 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 is around minimizing the management tasks that's based around, um, around running an enterprise um, OpenStack. So we started to look at this, with these design goals in mind, we started to look at this as sort of you know, the, what we were trying to achieve. And what, and what we've done was we set about designing an architecture that, around, around this. So this architecture we deploy today for our customers in Dell. And over the next couple of minutes, we'll, we'll take a look at some of the elements that go into actually uh, realizing this architecture. So when we, when we start to look at this, the, we suddenly begin to realize that um, the, the architecture for, for enterprise is, is more than just the element of OpenStack. Okay? So we, we, we have storage. Um, <clears throat> So we looked at the stack within, inside Dell and, and what, 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 what we had to offer. And we started to look at, from the top down, we started to look at you know, multi-cloud manager, the ability to sort of um, manage a cloud in a way that allowed you to just have more than just OpenStack on, on, uh, in a private setting, but also you might want to have, say, some of your cloud resources in a public setting. We started to look at OpenStack itself, which we'll take you through in a minute. And we started to look at storage and what we had to offer around storage. And, and, and we looked at this sort of two areas of, of, what, uh, of what Dell had to offer. Part of it being Equalogic, which is you know, your traditional storage. And we have a set of drivers for Cinder um, uh, that supports this. We started to look at you know, some customers like you know, want to use um, uh, open source software. So we've chosen to go down the route of, of SEP. We started to look at uh, deployment, and one of the one of the parts for us was that um, deployment is something that should be easy. I mean, it shouldn't take a long time to spin up a cloud. It shouldn't be complicated. Um, Crowbar, Crowbar is a project that, um, that that we looked at, and we said, you know, we, inside Dell, it was it was open sourced, and we said this is a is a very good platform on which we base our development. We'll take you through all this as, uh, in more detail as we go through. We looked at the networking. We said, you know, best in breed networking, force 10. 
Um, we looked at server range. We chose to go down the, with, with R620, R720, and C6100. I mean, these are all uh, cloud you know, grade uh, servers with features specifically for cloud. Um, <clears throat> we'll, security. Security is one of those things that was absolutely a must for an enterprise. So we started, we, we talked, we, you know, we, we worked with our, with our security team to build, an, uh, at, at a very early stage, the architecture that shows that it was secure. <clears throat> and then wrapping all of this up um, is the ability to have this managed if you wanted it managed. So uh, Dell Cloud, that's what Dell Cloud Services does. You know, it, if, you, if you don't want to manage it, they will manage it on-premise or off-premise. You, you get this one. So Crowbar, yes, so deployment. So in our space, we have the, uh, the Crowbar tool, which is a great tool to deploy the... Uh, Crowbar, okay, um, and we, we looked at it from the, the deployment model. Um, Crowbar offers an excellent deployment model. It's uh, one of the few. It's, it's one of the few products that actually manages the the the, the complete stack from the actual hardware um, uh, provisioning up to the um, up to the software layer. Okay, so one of the things we have in in, in Crowbar that's sort of unique is the ability to provision hardware. Okay. This provisioning of hardware is something that starts with the idea that you know, you, when, when, when you kick off uh, um, uh, a run of, of Crowbar, what you actually get is um, uh, it, will, it will go out, it will seek all the nodes that are available. And, what, uh, and uh, once it finds those nodes, it, makes the, it, it basically starts to interrogate those nodes and starts to figure out if the, uh, if the bias um, is, is current. And if the BIOS isn't current, what it'll do is it will, it, it will start to upgrade the BIOS. It will start to look at um, the individual um, uh, firmware on the individual cards on the server. And it will start to upgrade the firmware on those cards. It'll start to do the configuration of the BIOS. And it starts to do the configuration of the network cards and, and all of the PCI cards within, within the actual server itself. So it, it actually brings your, your, your hardware infrastructure up to a stage where it is um, at a known state, okay? um, and you, you're, you're current. Um, it then starts to lay down um, using what they call a set of bar clamps, which are set to modules um, uh, within OpenStack that basically define um, how the actual deployment is going to look from an OpenStack point of view. This is uh, how the, which nodes are going to be controller nodes and which nodes are going to be um, compute nodes. And it starts to lay down the software based on, based on the bar clamps within those nodes itself. Um, it, you know, it, it's what, it's within a very short space of time, you know, typically we're looking at a rack of servers and you, know, you can provision up a rack of servers in a very, very short space of time. It's got a, it's got a web UI, so this is web UI driven. So it allows you to, 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 to become very familiar very quickly um, uh, with, 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 with the tasks that it can, it can carry out. The bar clamps themselves are something that you can, you can create yourself. Um, they are basically internally, they're chef um, uh, recipes uh, with a wrapper of, of a bar clamp around it which, which, which basically augment uh, the, the chef recipe. Um, so, you can, so, you can, so if you've got proprietary uh, requirements, you can actually um, uh, create bar clamps for to add this functionality inside your in, inside your infrastructure. <clears throat> so if we look at sort of just a, a small 
um, on the on the left hand side, you know, you've typically got your bar clamps, which would be sort of your database bar clamp, your identity bar clamp, your image bar clamp, you know, your block storage, networking, Nova, Horizon. <coughs> this is, these are the elements that go into uh, OpenStack. Um, OpenStack basically does a pixie boot on all your servers. Um, it lays down a, a, what they call a sledgehammer image, um, which does all the interrogation um, and all the actual uh, firmware upgrade and, uh, and the configuration of your, of your firmware. Because quite a considerable amount of time goes into, when you think about it, a considerable amount of time goes into the provisioning of the hardware itself um, and, and, and doing all of that upgrade of the, of, of the firmware. Um, and one of the nice parts about it is once your infrastructure is in place, the ability to upgrade afterwards um, and come along and lay down new firmware uh, on the system is, is pretty easy. So at one of the elements that's built into Crowbar is that it uses Chef and you know, lots, Chef is, is familiar to many people, so it's, it, it's, it's pretty easy to create those bar clamps and extend it. And on the, on the right hand side, you basically get an idea that you know, it creates your, your, your cloud for you. So we had Crowbar 1.x, OK? And as, as the project has matured over the past 18 months, we've seen a huge amount of change within the industry. And then we've started to refactor our thinking around Crowbar. And we started to move towards Crowbar 2. Crowbar 2 is, is, is an open source project, so it's, it's, it's currently under development. Um, and you know we're look, you're very interested in people that want to get involved in the project. Um, we're sort of moving towards a time frame for Crowbar 2 of as we move towards the middle of next year. Okay? Um, so it's, 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 it's going to bring a lot of new functionality. Um, so within the infrastructure, um, when we looked at this, one of the one of the things we one of the, the, the areas that we saw as a, as a sort of complication um, was around load balancing. Many of the models that exist today um, you sort of work on the basis that you know you'll have a um, you'll have a an active passive arrangement, and there's nothing wrong with this. I mean, this works very well, and it's it's tried and proven. You know, we, you've got something like Keep Alive D. Um, you've got your load balancer and you've got your VIP. Okay, the incoming requests basically come in through the VIP and, uh, and, and, and hit the load balancer and are spread out to, the, um, to, to Keystone or any of the API endpoints. Okay. Um, this model works pretty good. And in a failover situation, um, you know, what happens is the VIP through Keep Live D, it'll, it, it will actually move over to the other node in a, in a, in a failure situation. And, um, and the other node basically picks up where, where, the, where, the, where the original node number or controller or zero uh, picks up its work. I mean, does anyone see anything wrong with this model? OK, here's, 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 here's one of the areas that's, that I see and we saw as being a difficulty. It doesn't scale. You have one server that you've spent you know, substantial amount of money keeping there running, and it's not really doing a whole lot. Okay? That's one area. The other area is bottlenecking. Okay? I mean, it doesn't scale. You, you, what you're doing is you're pulling all of the traffic. And I mean, you're talking about traffic around you know, Keystone. You're talking about all the traffic around, around uh, Neutron. You're talking about the API traffic around Neutron, You're not, not, not the individual uh, compute node traffic. You're talking about the Cinder API traffic, the Keystone API traffic, the Nova API traffic. You're talking about um, the scheduler, because the scheduler goes through um, uh, RabbitMQ, and RabbitMQ is load balanced behind it. Okay? So you begin to form the picture. You know, you've got Horizon in there, we've got Glance. All of these services basically are bottlenecked through that one point. Okay? Your network card uh, or cards, if you've got them bonded, are going to saturate. Okay, you get enough tr net network traffic through there, that's what, that's, what you, that's what you're going to get. So we started to look at this and we said, mm, you know, we need to load balance the load balancer. Sounds a bit crazy. Um, but we do. And that's what we decided to do. So within, within networking, we've, we've we, we, you know, 
Um, we came up with the concept. Um, we've seen others do it. I mean, it's, it's not unique. Um, where basically, we've, we've taken our network switches, our force 10s, and basically the routing within the, within the actual network switches, we're using OSPF, OSPF and uh, uh, e e M e M ECMP, okay? And we're basically spreading the traffic amongst the load balancers. Basically what's going on is inside, inside the networking switch itself, you've got a router. And inside each of the individual um, controller nodes, in this case we have three controller nodes, we have got Quagga, which is a router, okay? The endpoints are all serviced internally, inter internally within the node, meaning that you can't really get to the endpoints directly, okay? You have to come through Quagga, okay? So what's gonna happen is, is that when you, when you, when you make a, an API request, it's gonna, it's, it's, gonna, it's, gonna come, it's gonna come into one of the switches where it's gonna, it's gonna find its way, the packet is gonna be routed, okay, based on, on, on the criteria we lay down within the router itself, and it's gonna, it's gonna land on one of the, the quaggas to be routed onwards into the API, okay, because the API is, is held internally. And once they, once, once, the, once they hit the API, they're hitting the, the HA proxy, and the HA proxy just does its normal job of distributing the load amongst the, the keystone. This arrangement works very well because it's, it's load balancing the load balancer. And um, if, if, you, if you get a situation where um, because of the, if you get a situation where you lose one of the controller nodes, the, root, the OSPF is gonna recognize that that route isn't there anymore, okay? So it, the packets are not gonna be sent down to, it's not gonna to try to send those packets down to, down, down to the, the, that particular controller node. So it's a very resilient model. Um, uh, it's a very resilient model. So, we, one of the, outside the load balancer, we started to look at Neutron. And with, with Grizzly, we found that, um, we found that, uh, you know, the, 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 advan the advantage that had been brought in Grizzly was the, the ability to distribute the, um, the L2 and L3 and DCHP agents amongst nodes. I mean, this, we, this is the model that, you know, that a lot of people will see. You're either running, you know, you're running sort of, you're networking through one point, okay? This is the bottlenecking problem, coming back again, but this is based around the tenant, because all the tenant networks, um, or tenant networks are gonna be hosted inside the actual network node. That network node could be on a controller node, okay? So you still end up with the same problem. You know, you've, you, you, no matter where you host that, that you know, the, the actual um, uh, Neutron API, and the neutron services, you're still going to end up with that, with that, with bottlenecking all of that traffic into, into one area. And we, we, we took advantage of what Grizzly had to offer and we'd gone with a different model. And we, you know, we, we, we chose to distribute our load amongst all of the computes. So what we do is we install the, the L3, the DCHP, and the OSPF agents onto the compute nodes. And we place on the controller nodes, we place um, uh, neutron, um, the Neutron API, which has got the scheduler built into it. And what happens is, is that when, um, when you get a provisioning request from, from, for, for a new network, um, the scheduler is going to basically look to, to, look to the compute nodes um, uh, for which one is, is available to take that tenant network. By spreading out the tenant networks amongst all of the compute nodes, we're, we're, spreading, we're spreading the load amongst a wider, we're spreading the tenant load amongst a wider, uh, a wider um, a server base. Um, this gives us a big advantages in that in the, in, in the, in the case of failure, where we've got, we've got to spread over a wider area, so we're less, li we're less likely to have, um, uh, take down a, as many tenant networks, okay? Um, if we do take down a tenant network, we can just reprovision, okay? So in, a, in, in this situation, we can reprovision the tenant network very, very quickly um, and get, get the tenant network back up and going again. So RabbitMQ, um, we, with RabbitMQ, the model that you know the, the, we, you know, it, that we see used and you know is in a singular sort of service situation just wasn't going to work. Okay, so we didn't do any. We, you know, we, we took advantage of what was there, and we're using a clustered model um, uh, with, with mirrored with, mir with mirrored queues. This works very well for us. We've placed it behind the load balancer, um, effectively again across our controller nodes. And in our controller node situation. 
I showed three, call, three uh, controller nodes there, but there can be, you know, this can be up to n times the controller load. It scales uh, pretty linearly. Um, so we end up with a situation basically being a clustered, um, uh, a, a clustered rabbit MQ. Um, and it services all the requests coming in through the load balancer. Because it's the dynamic load balancer, again, we've got that added advantage of it, it being load balancing the load balancer. So we, you know, at the heart of, um, uh, of uh, you know, the most open stacks is, is going to be the database. If the database isn't stable, um, we're into problems, okay? Um, so we, this, this is a, bit, a little bit boring, but I want to take you through this for a reason. Um, you know, a, a single, you know, this sort of just shows a, singular mo a single model, um, you know, where you've got a single database, and we all know that that's going to fail. It's going, you know, if it fails, you know, what, that's it, you're, you're dusted. It's not, it's, it, it's you know, your, 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 your open stack is down. You know, single point of failure, that's the biggest disadvantage. We started to look at you know, the active passive model that would traditionally be used. Um, and you know, it's a good model. Um, the data is asynchronously replicated. Um, and in the event of a failure, um, you know, the VIP moves over like we saw earlier on. And um, the load is taken up by the other server. I mean, this works. Um, but it's got asynchronous replication. I suppose the question is, does anyone see any problems with asynchronous replication? I'll leave that for a minute and I'll come back to it. Um, so yeah, you, you know, you, you, you've got that. You've also got a scale limit, okay? So this, this, this model only scales so far. You've also got the fact that you've got one server there sitting most of the time doing very little, only waiting for the other one to fail. So it's a waste of resources. So, you know, we looked at, um, we looked at uh, DRDB, okay? This model, you know, works pretty good. Um, the data is replicated. Um, again, you have this problem in that the server is, is basically one server sitting there. I won't say doing very little, but it's, it's, it's accepting the data um, uh, replication from the other server. But again, it's doing, it's doing very little, and it's a waste of resources. Um, and in the event of failure, you know, it, it fails over um, pretty much the same as, as, as the active pass model. And, you know, it, again, it limits scale. Um, you know, and we, we looked at, um, at, at, at uh, multi-master replication, okay? So this would be your typical um, MySQL um, approach, okay? There's nothing unique here. Um, and in the event of a, you know, in this model we have uh, two applications and a load balancer, two streams of two streams of, of queries coming into the ser server cluster, and being serviced, and the replication going on between the servers. Okay, and this is your typical typical scenario. In the event of a failure, you know, the the traffic is routed to one of the other servers, and the the the, the server that um, that died is 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 it's okay, and everything just works away as normal. But there's a problem. Not the next slide. There's no guarantee that at any point the data is consistent across all nodes. Because of asynchronous replication, the best you can hope for is that the data got to the other node before it failed. If it didn't, you're into a scenario where that server is now has different data than the rest of the, than the, rest of the cluster. Okay? That means when you go to bring it back online, you have to get manually involved in it. You have to somehow try to figure out what is in this table versus the, ta the, t the current tables, and you're into problems. Okay? One of the other things that we looked at was uh, single thread replication. So the typical out-of-the-box MySQL uses a single thread for replication. This increases your probability of actually having inconsistency within, uh, within your cluster in, in, a, in a failure situation, okay? Because you've only got one thread, and in this, in this, in this uh, slide, you can see I've marked the, 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 it's using one processor core to do the replication that is equal to one thread. And this means that 
you've all this, you've all this server available to you. But you're only replicating using one thread. So we spoke about the disadvantages. You know, they should be starting to become obvious. So we looked at what could we do. We decided to use the Percona model. Okay, Percona has got synchronous replication. That means within the cluster, at any point in time, the data is always consistent. And I'll speak a little bit about that in a minute. Let's go back to one slide. So it's also a multi-master. It's also a multi-master model much like the multi-master model we, we spoke about earlier. Um, it's got automatic node provisioning, which I'll speak about in a minute. Um, and it does a parallel apply on all nodes. Okay. So, synchronous replication. This means that when a query arrives on a controller node, and there can be you know, multiple controller nodes, I've just simplified it here, um, it is wrote to all other nodes within the cluster, and all other nodes accept, and only when it's accepted is it deemed a valid query. Okay? Um, it's wrote to all nodes. Like I said, all the, all the data is consistent across all nodes at all times, meaning that you can get a failure at any point in time, and you can be guaranteed that all nodes are consistent. Makes it very, very easy for bringing, bringing the, the fail node back online because you know the data is consistent. You've got multi threaded replication, reducing the problem that you saw earlier on. Okay? You've, got, you've got multiple cores in your, in, on your server. It's take, the, the, the replication is, is taking advantage of all the cores. So replication doesn't, doesn't become a bottleneck. Automatic provisioning. You want to add a new node into the cluster? You don't have to worry about getting the data from one node to the other or, or any of those complications or problems. It joins automatically. There's no, there's, no, there's no difficulties involved. So you can scale this out pretty easily enough. And as we spoke about, it's a multi-master multi model. So it gives us a stable platform on which to build our OpenStack infrastructure on. We looked at block storage, and one of the things we started to sort of look at was enterprises, you know, it, they've got both that forward-leaning, maybe in, as we move towards the future, that forward-leaning application, those enterprise applications, and they've also got legacy applications. So it's not a, it's, it's not a very clean world. It's a lot cleaner world in the world of, of, of public cloud, where, you know, people are tendency to move towards the, the more forward-leaning application, where, you know, the, the the resilience is built into the software. Okay. Um, enterprises don't have that luxury. They have applications that have been sitting there for 10 years and they're not going to be upgraded. But they want to move them to the cloud, to, take the, to, uh, to a private cloud, to take the advantages of it. One of, the ways they can, one of the ways we have to deal with that is by providing storage that's reliable. Okay. We use Equalogic. Equalogic has a driver for OpenStack. Um, it's a two-head node configuration means we've got, we've, got, we've got a certain amount of resilience. For people that are, really want to go down the open stack or the, the open source route, we have SEP. And we put that on our, on our R720s, which is a very good platform for, for, from a performance point of view where we use SSDs. So I suppose to wrap up um, and take a very just quick look at what we do for the rest of the services. You know, the rest of the services are all based around Sitting those APIs behind the dynamic load balancer. You know, it's, it's, it's about sitting the glance behind the dynamic load balancer. It's, you know, sitting the Nova API around about the, the, uh, 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 behind the, 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 the load balancer and Keystone and all of the other services. Um, and again, you know, we sit, the, we sit the MySQL behind the load balancer as well. So, you know, this gives you the model and it's a fairly resilient model. I mean, Within the lab environment, particularly where we do a lot of the, the fault testing, um, it's, it's proven to be an extremely solid base for an enterprise-grade cloud. And I suppose that's the part that we're trying to differentiate, is an enterprise-grade cloud. So hopefully we got through that pretty quickly. Um, 
if, if anyone wants to dig deeper into the, in, into the elements that we spoke about and today, um, you can join us at the boot, the Dell boot, and we'll be there for the next 40 minutes. You're all quite, quite welcome. Thank you for coming. <laughs>